evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School for what I hope will be a, oh, I'm actually certain, will be a, a fantastically interesting and topical lecture this evening. Um, my name's Cameron Hepburn. If you don't know me, I'm a professor of environmental economics here, uh, and we're talking tonight about possibly one of the biggest questions in well, for humanity, but also in my little field. Uh, and so I'm delighted that we've got Varun Sivaram with us. Now, Varun is already very distinguished, despite, as you can see, being so young. Uh, and not the only element of his distinction is having been at Oxford, and indeed as part of uh, the Oxford Martin School in his work on um, solar physics with Professor Henry Snaith. Uh, but he was here on a Rhodes Scholarship, a very fine scholarship, which I commend to those of you who, who don't have one. Uh, you should, you should, you should pick, pick one up sometime. Uh, after a, a, quite an interesting undergraduate uh, trajectory, which included physics and uh, international relations at Stanford. Now, Varun has gone on from his Oxford doctorate uh, to do several interesting things. Probably the least interesting is work at McKinsey. And uh, one of the, I shouldn't say that, should I? McKinsey is a fascinating place. I was there too. I say it with great love. Uh, but one of the most interesting things I think he's done is write this book. And, um, but I should say right now, he is the Philip Reed Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in the States. Um, now, there have been various comments already made about this book, if you're not aware of it. Uh, I commend it to you. And I think we may even have, possibly, um, some copies at the back uh, for some signatures. Um, and uh, so it's been described, or in fact, some of his work has been described by uh, an American, some of you have heard of, called Bill Gates, as the best argument for the clean energy revolution. The FT um, described the book, uh, I think they could have done better, honestly, but, but as, uh, as the, the best available overview of the solar industry. But The Economist takes the cake uh, and uh, describes it. I'm just going to use one word out of a full review. It's the most important word, as prescient. At least that's how we pronounce it over this side of the pond. Now, the other reason I'm absolutely delighted to have Varun with us this evening is we've had the pleasure of having Lillian Martin and Jaron with us uh, today. And, and they asked me several difficult questions about the solar industry. And I was able to say, I'm delighted that you'll be here at the lecture, and Varun can ask them for you. So uh, all questions will be answered. If they're not answered in the next 45 to 50 minutes, then we will have a very good Q&A. So um, save them up. And uh, Varun, I welcome you to the stage. I, w I welcome all of you to engage in what will be a very exciting lecture. Thank you. Did you know that the sun beams down more energy in an hour than the entire world uses in a year? As the world races to avert catastrophic climate change, the sun offers by far the most abundant source of clean energy. And by harnessing it, countries can also power economic growth, expand electricity access, and reduce energy imports. Over the last decade, solar has gone from expensive novelty to the cheapest, fastest growing power source on Earth. But here's the thing. We could squander its potential if we don't plan for the future. Today, solar supply is just 2% of the world's electricity. And even though it might look like solar power could keep on growing exponentially, its rise could very well hit a ceiling, flattening out in coming decades far before it unseats dominant fossil fuels. In Europe, we're already seeing the slowdown. And if that happens on a global scale, the solar revolution could sputter out. Preventing that is the point of my new book, Taming the Sun. I argue that three types of innovation are needed to unlock solar's full potential. The first innovation is financial. Right now, solar needs to attract trillions of dollars to fuel its rise. But so far, the world's most deep-pocketed investors have largely sat on the sidelines. So the solar industry needs to take a page out of the playbook from the fossil fuel, automobile, and mortgage industries and bundle together solar projects so big institutional investors feel comfortable buying and trading them. I'm pretty confident the industry will figure that one out. But 
just as soon as solar gets over that funding speed bump, it could run into a much more serious obstacle known as value deflation. See, all this investment will help the industry produce and deploy more solar panels, driving down the cost of building a new solar project. That's the good news. But the bad news is that the value of the electricity produced by solar will plunge even faster. As more solar panels come online, they'll flood the grid with power in the middle of the day, but shut off when the sun sets. Even though customers will need power during dinner time, the next solar panel will just feed them more lunchtime power. That's not very valuable. Soon, the value will fall below the cost, so it won't make economic sense to install any more solar panels. That will halt the momentum of solar's rise. Overcoming this barrier starts with technological innovation. Breakthroughs in solar technology could cause the cost of solar to plunge, enabling more solar to be deployed economically. Next generation technologies, such as perovskites, already exist in laboratories. and They could transform today's heavy, rigid, and frankly ugly solar panels into lightweight, flexible, and colorful coatings that tomorrow could cover cityscapes around the world. Additionally, developing advanced solar thermal plants could convert the sun's energy into heat and use that heat to generate power 24-7 rather than just at lunchtime. And one day, artificial leaf technology could even harness sunlight to make portable fuels, finally making oil obsolete. Still, even with these two types of innovation, solar will need a third to limit the decline of its value as more of it's deployed. And that would be systemic innovation which includes things like continent-spanning power grids that link sun-drenched deserts to power-hungry cities, energy markets that pay for energy storage and flexible generators to smooth out the volatile swings of solar power, and smart software that can turn electric vehicles into mobile batteries to resupply the grid once the sun goes down. These innovative energy systems would preserve solar's value by making sure that solar power can be used no matter when it's produced or how it fluctuates. Promoting all three kinds of innovation will require urgent investments by governments all around the world. And that needs to start right now. If we wait until solar runs out of steam, it'll be too late to get it back on track. But if we get this right, the 21st century will finally be the one in which humankind secures cheap, clean, and virtually limitless energy, all by taming the sun. Thank you. Hey everyone, I am thrilled to be back here. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks to the, the Martin School uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, thank you as well. It, it's an honor, Cameron, uh, to have you introduce me. Look, if you guys haven't guessed from some of our career similarities, Cameron Hepburn is a pretty good answer uh, to when I get asked, who do you want to be when you grow up? Um, you know, I, I, it, it's an honor to, to have you both here, Jaron and Lillian, uh, in the audience. Um, and I'm just so happy to be back here at Oxford. So look, I thought I'd start with a little story from my first days at Oxford. Actually, the, the story starts right before I got to Oxford. Right before I got to Oxford, I came in the fall of 2011, sometime in the summer, one of the graduate students in the laboratory that I would join, Michael Lee, went on an expedition to Tokyo. He went to the Toyin University in Tokyo was trying to find this reclusive professor who had a particular chemical recipe for a material that no one really cared about in the solar field. Tracks this guy down, takes him to a bar. Uh, at, at some point, this might be embellishment, but not by me, probably by Michael. Takes him to a bar and gets him to write a recipe on a beer coaster. Takes this beer coaster back on a plane, comes back to Oxford. October 2011, this is about a month after I've landed, I, we all file into the lab meeting you know, every uh, week. Henry Snaith's lab has a lab meeting, and one student is tasked with presenting the most recent results. So Michael gets up. He's known to be a jokester, and so he spends his you know, first 10 slides talking about some jokes. And then he puts up on the slide a picture of a 10% efficient solar cell. All of us start, you know, we're, we're giggling, we're laughing, like, who is this guy? We have never had better than a 5.5% solar cell. But here's Mike 
dead serious all of a sudden, this jokester, and his 10% solar cell is not a measurement artifact, it is actually a real solar cell. And we suddenly realize he's not joking. Henry's not joking either, Henry learned about it the previous night. What's happened is that Michael took back the beer coaster, and Michael always likes to work late at night, like 2 a.m. in the lab, right? He's looking at his beer coaster, and he flips two of the chemical concentrations, 3 molar and 0.3 molar for two different ingredients. Voila, what comes out is the most efficient solar cell of its kind, an emerging photovoltaic technology known as perovskite. From that moment, in 2012, this gold rush ensues. Michael and Henry publish a science paper. Over the next two years, 30 nature and science papers get published on this particular topic, perovskites. It's the hottest topic in physics. Um, and, and around the world, groups that have historically worked on other kinds of solar cell technologies, or even nothing related to solar cells, just broader optoelectronics groups, they all pile into perovskites, the coolest technology in physics. This sounds like it's gonna have a happy ending, right? Cool technology, this technology does everything you want it to do, but I have seen this movie before. You know, back about a decade ago, I started my career in the solar industry working at a startup. It was called NanoSolar. And NanoSolar raised almost as much money as Facebook and more money than any other Silicon Valley startup that year, 2007. NanoSolar, six years later, would go belly up, as would a slew of other startups in the clean energy space. I've seen this movie before. I have seen innovative clean energy technologies fail because of market forces, because of unfair competition, whatever, because energy is a legacy entrenched sector and it's really hard to be innovative. And that's why even though I sincerely believe in perovskite and the potential of this and other transformative technologies, I think there is an imperative on us as policymakers, as private sector individuals, as academics, as citizens, to act and make sure that some of these innovations see the light of day, no pun intended. So with that, let me tell you a little more about Taming the Sun. You guys saw the thesis in the, in the quick video. Let me dive into some of the charts and tell you why I think that solar power has nearly unlimited potential, but why it's super urgent we act now to safeguard that potential. The book has four parts. Uh, the first part, oh, by the way, I will try not to give away too much of the book, uh, because as Cameron mentioned, there are copies uh, after the event. Deeply discounted copies, I hear. Um, the first part of the book sets the stage. It says, where have we come to date, and then why should we be worried, given all of this progress? Here is a sign of why we should be optimistic. Those cubes tell you that statistic from the video. Every hour, the sun beams down as much energy as the world uses in a whole year. But what these cubes obscure is that not only is solar super abundant, it's also super inconvenient. Look, solar hides behind the clouds in some regions, in other regions it scorches the terrain. It is non-portable, it's relatively diffuse all over. By contrast, fossil fuels are super convenient. I can, uh, t they're very portable, they're convenient, they're dense. Solar energy has been around for millennia and humans have tried to harness it. There is a reason we haven't succeeded until very recently. Now, very recently, we found out, aha, the familiar solar panel made out of silicon is now quite cheap. And so countries around the world, like India, which I'm showing here, have decided to set these audacious targets. India has set a target of 100 gigawatts. That would correspond to about 10% of its electricity just over the next five years. Look at that steep ramp that India is counting on. But what I worry about is that if India does not meet that target, it'll be saddled with an ever-increasing share of coal electricity. As you can see today, coal is most of its electricity. And India, even though it's today's third largest source of emissions in the world, could very well become the first by 2050. Now, there's a lot of euphoria over solar. On the right-hand side, you can see the quick ramp-up of solar electricity, which today accounts for about 2% of global electricity. I'm told, by the way, uh, that Lillian wants me to answer a specific question, which is, how high can that go? Now, I'll try and answer that later on, but to foreshadow, let me tell you about the experience of nuclear energy, which I think is a cautionary tale. 
In 1971, nuclear energy was the next great hope for cheap, clean, and abundant energy for all. And over the next two decades, it enjoyed a building boom. But then sometime in the 1990s, I think 1996, nuclear energy peaked at about 18% of global electricity supply, and it's declined ever since. Now, you may look at me and say, why on earth are you comparing nuclear and solar? Look, nuclear stalled because of accidents, activists, and ascending costs. That alliteration came from the book, in case you're interested. And solar doesn't have any of those problems, right? But I think there's an underlying similarity, and that underlying similarity is technological stagnation. That in the case of nuclear, you had a technology, the light water reactor, that has persisted ever since the US Navy commercialized it in the 1950s. Similarly, in the case of solar, photovoltaics, that's a fancy word for taking sunlight and converting it into electricity. We've largely had the same technology dominate solar, the silicon solar photovoltaic cell, as the one that was invented back in 1954. I worry that if this dominant design persists in solar, this technological stagnation could similarly cause it to hit a ceiling. Still, we shouldn't neglect the remarkable progress made to date. Now, I want to spend a couple slides just telling you about how far we've come. See, a decade ago, if you told me where solar was today, I would never have believed you. In the last few decades, solar has gotten cheaper and better thanks to technological improvements in part. This chart tells you about some of those technological improvements. Many of these charts, by the way, are going to be like pretty complex, and I don't really want you to look at every data point. So I'm going to try and point out the highlights. The highlight here is the blue curve. The blue curve is silicon. Silicon has increased in how much sunlight it can convert into electricity. That's known as the efficiency from somewhere less than 15% in the 1970s to over 25% currently. That's a great increase. And many of these gains reduce the cost because the more efficient your silicon solar panel is, the fewer panels you need to generate the same power and the cheaper it is to put them on your roof or to put them in a desert. So that's great. That's the story of how far we've come. Again, some foreshadowing. Look at that line. This was the cell that Michael Lee made in Oxford and that launched the gold rush. Ever since, perovskite has been improving faster than any technology in history. But it's not just technology that's gotten better. It's also been the economies of scale that have come with massive production of silicon solar panels in China. China ramped up its production of solar panels. It put companies like NanoSolar out of business, but that's another story for another day. And it's also ramped up its deployment of solar energy so that China today accounts for roughly half of the global market. Some of you may have heard that just last week, China decided to slash its deployment in 2018 of solar. That's going to have enormous effects on the market because, solar, or because China does account for half of that global market. But because of these economies of scale and because of the learning that's gone along with this cumulative production of solar, the cost has fallen rapidly. So since 1976, the cost of solar has fallen from just around $100 per watt to now less than 40 cents per watt of each solar panel. That's a remarkable decline. I do want to make the point, though, that many people show this curve. Very few people notice that the reason the cost declined over here was because technology was getting better. The reason the cost declined over here was because the scale was increasing. The mechanisms are different over time, even though this curve might imply a regularity over the last four decades. Around the world, another complicated chart, I'm sorry, but around the world, the cost of solar has fallen. You can see this general trend downward, such that in Dubai, Chile, Mexico City, India, you are seeing costs of solar electricity that are lower than any fossil fuel. You're seeing costs at the three, even two cents per kilowatt hour level. These are unheard of costs at scale. Some of them have subsidies baked in, but the underlying trend is legitimate the cost of solar has come down. As a result, I'm going to blow through these. As a result, in the biggest markets, China, United States, India, solar is going to be cheaper than every other fuel, coal, for example, combined cycle gas turbines, even when you take into account some of the other costs of solar, like the transmission lines that connect it. Solar is going to be cheaper than them 
by 2025 if you compare a solar plant to a new fossil fuel plant, and it'll be cheaper by 2030 if you compare a new solar plant to an existing fossil fuel plant. Those are compelling economics. All of this leads the International Energy Agency, actually I think this is Bloomberg, to project that even though solar is a very small slice of the global electricity mix today, by 2040, solar capacity will be about a third of global electricity generating capacity, and the actual amount of solar electricity will be 15% of the global total by 2040, fully half of which comes from China, India, and the Middle East. Okay, I'm gonna pause there because I ran you through a bunch of slides. The moral here, everything looks good. Solar is growing rapidly. Analysts think it's gonna continue growing. It's on pace to hit 15%. Uh, Lillian, I haven't forgotten your question, but let me tell you what the analysts say. I'm not sure where Lillian is. Let me tell you what the analysts say, which is that solar is gonna hit 15% by 2040. I don't believe it. Here's why. I told you earlier on in the video that solar electricity is less valuable the more of it you put on a grid. And this chart shows you estimates that my colleagues and I have compiled from around the world showing exactly how much solar eats its own lunch or cannibalizes its own value. Can I get a show of hands? Tell me if, raise your hand if you thought the value deflation explanation in the video was clear. So that's about two thirds of the room. So, so I'll just quickly run through it one more time. The more solar you have on the grid, the more you have a glut of electricity right in the middle of the day. That means that even though the first solar panel was super useful, for example, on a summer Californian day, that first solar panel helped you to meet your air conditioning demand, the millionth solar panel is not that valuable. The millionth solar panel is just putting on electrons in the middle of the day when you already have a glut, not at the end of the day when you need it. As a result, the value of the marginal solar panel addition is very low. In California, the value of that solar panel addition when you have 30% of your energy coming from solar falls by 70%. That means that your million solar panel is only 30% as valuable as your first solar panel. And there are similar results for Texas and Germany. All of this is to say, don't extrapolate from existing trends. Solar may be cost effective today. We may be optimistic, given that solar's cost continues to decline. But if its cost doesn't decline much faster, its value will fall below that cost. Here's a good way of visualizing it. This is called the duck curve. You can't really see, but there's a duck here. Um, I think I am the first to actually draw a duck on the duck curve. And this duck curve basically tells you, in fact, a, a better slide to show this is this graph. The duck curve shows you that in the middle of the day in California, there's a lot of solar and all the other generators, other renewable energy, gas, nuclear, hydroelectric, they all imports from other places. They all have to ramp up at 5 p.m. when the sun sets. Well, you can see, therefore, that the price of power on a March day goes negative. The market is saying, please, shut off your power plants. We have too much electricity. There is too much solar on the grid. And at the end of the day, the price spikes. We're begging for sources of electricity that can give us dinnertime power, not lunchtime power. Putting on another solar panel is uneconomic in California today. The only reason that you will see another solar panel in California is because of a mandate or a subsidy. That's not a great way for the world to install more solar panels. Now, many of you may disagree with me on this, but I sincerely believe that solar has an important role to play and should keep growing, but it can't grow on the back of subsidies and mandates. They're too expensive. We need solar to grow in a market-driven fashion, and that market doesn't want solar. So what do we do about it? Well, I mentioned that there are those three types of innovation, financial, technological, and systemic. And for the next 20 or so minutes, I'm gonna walk you through each of them. I'm gonna start with financial. Remember, financial innovation is the one I'm most confident about. I think that the industry is probably going to figure out how to acquire the trillions of dollars it needs to keep solar growing and avoid a funding speed bump. That speed bump, a roadblock, occurs because today's existing sources just don't have the kind of capital that solar needs to keep growing. 
Now, the blue bars here tell you about the existing sources of funding for solar. They include governments. They include private equity funds. These guys, tax equity investors in the US, these guys have historically funded solar, and they'll continue to fund it. But they're not going to fund enough. And there will be a $2.5 trillion shortfall between now and 2040. That's the salmon color bars. Well, if we're going to meet that shortfall, we're going to need to call on the deep-pocketed investors. And those deep-pocketed investors include institutional investors, like pension funds. They include large corporations who have large balance sheets. Remember, in the oil and gas sector, it's large oil companies that have the balance sheets to do project development. We're going to rely on these new investors to come in and fund solar. And if we want them to do that, we're going to require them to have ways to buy and trade solar very easily. See, today, institutional investors struggle to invest in an individual solar project. They don't want to do it. A big pension fund is set up to buy and trade stocks. They don't want to have to do due diligence on each single solar project. To make it easy on them, some folks came up with this genius idea called a yield co. The yield co, in the United States at least, was a great idea until it wasn't. This is the stock price of yield co, that blue line. It was doing very well until the summer of 2015, and then it plummeted. And in that summer, what we learned was that the United States' yield co's had structured themselves far too greedily. They required continued growth and increasing share prices in order to stay afloat. When that unraveled, the music stopped. By the way, in the United Kingdom, yield co's were structured in a much more sane way. They just packaged together projects without unrealistically requiring growth in the portfolio. I believe that going forward, we're going to need vehicles kind of like the UK Yield Co, not the United States Yield Co, to give large investors a way to buy and trade diverse portfolios of solar projects on stock markets. In addition, we might use securitization. Now, you might look at the slide and go, oh, no, 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 we're not using securitization. That's the thing that made the US housing market and the whole world go into a recession. You are right. <laughs> but Securitization can be done responsibly, and in chapter four, if you're interested, I walk through the mechanics of how to do it. I won't bore you with the details here. Now, in addition to all of these complicated pieces of financial engineering, I want to talk about one very exciting thing uh, that I found in my research, which is that solar has the potential not only to help out developed countries, but also developing countries. It can help solve this intractable problem of energy poverty. See. Around the world, as you can see from this figure, over a billion people lack access to any electricity. Another billion lack access to reliable electricity. They're concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Solar energy, because it's suddenly inexpensive, can help these folks achieve electricity for the first time. And that's just using existing technology. Here's one way you can do so, through a new business model called pay-as-you-go. The pay-as-you-go business model has four phases. In the first one, an entrepreneur or a startup, uh, many are operating in East Africa, some in South Asia, will come over and install a solar system in your house. Now, this solar system is very simple. For the first time, you will have the ability to have lights, LED lights, uh, maybe even a radio. You'll have a cell phone charger, maybe even a TV. It'll come with a battery so that you can have electricity 24-7. Importantly, you won't have to foot the entire upfront cost of the solar system. Rather, that firm is going to pay most of it for you. You'll then use mobile money to pay monthly installments. And after several of these monthly installments, you'll actually pay off the entire system. And suddenly, you will own a valuable asset. So not only will you have gotten electricity for the first time, you now will have this valuable solar panel asset against which you can raise credit using it as collateral. That is hugely economically empowering, and it's happening thanks to the cost declines of solar. It's also happening thanks to the cost declines of the associated ecosystem. For example, energy storage, batteries have fallen in cost, and most importantly, appliances. Energy efficient appliances, such as LED lights, have fallen substantially in cost, meaning that today's, or uh, the 2020 solar home system for an off grid village application is about half as expensive as it was in 2014. So that's great. Now, 
I come from a policy think tank, and I haven't told you one word about policy, so let me give you a policy recommendation. If you are a country in the developing world, what should you do here? All right, I'm gonna give you two choices. Should you subsidize the panels, or should you impose a mandate for off-grid solar? Raise your hand if you think you should subsidize the panels if you're a developing country government. Nobody raised their hands. Ah, one hand. Raise your hands if you think you should mandate the deployment of off-grid solar. Okay, I see like 36 hands. That's an estimate. I tricked you. It's neither of them. I think governments should have no business doing subsidies or mandates for solar anymore. We have cost-effective solar and storage solutions for these applications. What we need is a coordination role. Largely, I want governments to get out of the way. I want them not to enact trade barriers, for example, that make it difficult to bring in the right equipment. But where they can be helpful is what Nigeria is doing. Nigeria, for example, has created this map where they've delineated different regions that are ideal for extending the central grid or using off-grid microgrids or single home systems. Now, by creating this map, the blue regions are the central grid extensions. These are transmission lines. The green regions are where microgrids can network together communities. And the purple regions are single solar home systems. These regions are discovered by figuring out, hey, there's a big hill here. I don't want to build a transmission line. Or there's not enough people there. It doesn't make sense for me to extend the central grid. The Nigerian government is honest with itself. It doesn't have the resources to extend the grid to everybody. And so it's going to pick out regions where it can divide labor. And by doing that, this division of labor among the private and the public sector, it's then going to ensure that the investment climate is robust. See, if I'm an off-grid provider and I go and I create an off-grid uh, solution here or here, I'm not worried I'll be put out of business when the government extends its grid. Because I'm not in competition with the government, I'm incentivized to go ahead and create this free market solution. So that's a way I think that governments can be very constructive in the developing world, not putting the private sector out of business. Now, I've told you a lot of encouraging things that are already happening. Financial and business model innovation is bringing solar to more people than ever before. It's improving energy poverty, and it's doing all that with existing technology. Problem solved, right? Wrong. I also believe that at some point, we will hit our limit with existing technology. To answer Lillian's question finally, I do not believe that we will exceed 15% of the world's electricity with solar electricity solely with today's technology and today's very rigid energy systems. I think we're going to need technological innovation and systemic innovation to break through that barrier and achieve the goal that I set out in my book, which is 33% of the world's electricity coming from solar energy by 2050. Now, when I published my book in March uh, of this year, I was a pretty lonely voice saying this. And then a month later, this remarkable thing happened. Shell, a major oil company, came out with a scenario, the sky scenario, where they said if the world's going to uh, stay to its two degree global warming target, its limit, well, it's going to need solar at approximately 36% of world electricity by 2050. And oh, by the way, by 2100, a majority of its, elect uh, of its primary energy must come from solar which is another target that I set in my book. This is hugely gratifying because Shell and I took probably very different modeling approaches. I dare say you know, Cameron had some input into, into Shell's uh, modeling, but we both came up with the same answer, which is that solar has to be the dominant energy source for humanity this century. And if we don't get there, we squander our chance at a clean energy transition. Solar is not the only one, but it is the primary one. I dare say it should be the star of an energy revolution. So let me tell you a little bit first about technological uh, innovation. I believe that solar actually has a long way to go in terms of technology, and it's because where you stand depends on where you sit. Here, if you sit in the energy industry, you might look at power prices over time. This is US electricity prices and say, wow, solar is doing great. While electricity prices have stayed relatively constant, Solar has fallen in cost dramatically by a factor of over 100. But then you compare it to the cost of microchips. If you sit in Silicon Valley, that's where I was born and brought up, 
uh, you see that solar has not done very well in terms of its cost declines compared with the cost declines of a megabyte of storage. Look at that. Storage has fallen a million times faster in cost than solar has. And I think solar has a long way to go, and we've seen some of these transformative breakthroughs in laboratories. I'm going to skip some very boring slides. These are very boring. Another boring one. Although, if any physicists are in the room, you would like this one. And I'm going to get to the exciting one. Check this out. Today's technology, silicon, is all the way on this end of the spectrum. It is the simplest material you could imagine. A silicon crystal consists of silicon atoms repeating at regular intervals for the whole crystal. Super dead easy. Because you have a simple material, today's material, you require complex processing. You've got to heat this thing up to 1,000 degrees or more. You have to have expensive equipment in your expensive shiny factory to churn out a panel that is ugly, heavy, and rigid. Not great. Because you have a simple material, you have a non-versatile material and complex processing for your final product. On the other end of the spectrum, you can have complex materials, and they behave beautifully. So at the very smallest scales, the nanoscale, you have a super complex material. This is what's known as a quantum dot. This is a perovskite. Uh, all of these guys are sophisticated materials, and they require a lot of engineering at the smallest scales. But that means at the macro scale, they behave wonderfully. By wonderfully, I mean that you can print them. You could print them as easily as you print out a newspaper. They're also as versatile. You can make them lightweight, transparent, flexible. They can even be more efficient than silicon. That's what I'm super excited about in terms of technological innovation that can plunge the cost of solar much faster than even today's ongoing declines uh, forecast. Perovskite is the front runner. That looks pretty complicated, right? There's a lot of work going on to engineer at the nanoscale so that we can make it in this dead easy way. This is what we would do in the lab. We would take a pipette, drop some solution onto a slide, spin it really fast, and there you got it, a perovskite. There are other ways to do it as well, something known as a vapor deposition process. But the point is it's relatively easy to make this material that then behaves beautifully. It can do cool things. You can bend it. You can make it in what's called a roll-to-roll -roll process. Um, you can put it on a backpack, but that doesn't seem very helpful. Um, this, is a, this is a sample cell that came uh, out of our laboratory uh, in Oxford. You can bend it, clearly. Guess what? You can also make it any color you want. Well, most shades of yellow and red, but almost any color you want, um, which, which uh, foreshadows you know, applications on buildings. Skyscrapers could have this on their windows. But let me tell you, again, I mentioned earlier that I've seen this movie before. No matter how cool the technology is, it is not a good idea for an existing solar technology to go up against the incumbent which is silicon. Silicon accounts for over 90% of the world market, and it's entrenching its current dominant position. So if you're not going to go up against the incumbent dominant guy because you're going to lose, what do you do? You piggyback. Here is a figure from a paper that Henry, uh, our colleague Sam, and I wrote, where you have a silicon solar cell, today's technology, and you layer a perovskite right on top. And that allows you to do something clever. In the solar spectrum, this is the amount of energy that comes from the sun over all the different colors of light, the silicon harnesses the red and the infrared colors of light, and the perovskite harnesses the blue and the ultraviolet colors of light. So together, they're more efficient than either one would have been on its own. That's a cool technology, and more importantly, it allows you to go to market with a familiar-looking product. Basically, it looks like a silicon solar panel, except it works better. It's more efficient. And the more efficient your technology is, the fewer panels you need, the less land you need, the less equipment you need, labor, installation, your costs all decrease. This is the strategy that Henry Snate's company, Oxford Photovoltaics, is pursuing. And it's one of, in my opinion, two good strategies. The only other strategy is to go into a market that silicon cannot attack. For example, unmanned aerial vehicles that require lightweight coatings that silicon cannot produce. If you take these technologies and you bring them to market, and ultimately you ditch the piggyback strategy and you have a freestanding structure of perovskite layers, one stacked on top of the other, 
by the end of 2050, you could get to a 35% solar panel or coating. And that is a powerful proposition. That is what we need if we're going to get to a cost target of 25 cents per watt fully installed for a system or even lower. If we want to get to those low costs needed for solar to outrun value deflation for its cost to keep falling, well, we need to fund energy technology innovation. I'll get back to policy proposals for how to do so at the end, but let me foreshadow by saying governments better step up right now because it takes 10 years or more to develop some of these technologies. And private investors do not want to fund them. This is a study that I did with some colleagues studying the venture capital investments between 2006 and 2011 in Silicon Valley. Let me tell you, it was a painful time for me. I worked for two startups. They both went bankrupt. This bar makes me so sad. Venture capital investors poured $764 million into startups and clean tech that were developing new materials, like new solar materials, as well as new chemicals and new manufacturing processes. The gentleman in the audience is just really disgusted with this figure. I, I, I'm with you, man. They only got $123 million back. They lost the rest of it. They burned it. And the reason for that was partially that you know, the venture capital model is not well suited for this particular type of investing, but also it's really hard to get a company to succeed at the kind of return multiple you need in the venture capital industry when, on the flip side, two guys and a dog will get you a software startup that gives you a 10x or 100x multiple. I will say, today brought some good news. Today, Bill Gates' uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund announced its first two investments in long-term energy storage technologies. Uh, Yet Ming Chang at MIT got his company funded. I'm very bullish on it. So, you know, there is some good news that some investors are starting to get back into the space, but by and large, folks have run away from clean tech. Okay, Cameron's going to get mad at me if I don't get uh, to the rest of these slides, so I'm going to skip some of the other technologies. If anyone wants to know about artificial leaves or about concentrated solar power, let's try and talk about it in the question and answer session, because I want to tell you about putting it all together, systemic innovation. This is the last kind of innovation, and it's the, it's the kind that we can see results on right now. By making our energy systems more flexible and productive, we can use solar electricity no matter when it's produced or how much it fluctuates. There are four ways to do this. Let me run through all four ways. By the way, raise your hand if you thought I was going to talk about batteries in this section. Literally everybody, right? Like, if you think about it, you're like, give me a break. How hard can this be? Solar energy produces in the middle of the day and not at the end of the day. Put a battery on every solar panel, and suddenly you will store all that electricity, and then you'll get to use it when you need it. This seems like a super simple silver bullet, right? It's not. I'll prove it to you. I want, uh, if there's one lesson you take away, it's that silver bullet thinking is super dangerous. That we need a portfolio of solutions if we want to make our energy systems flexible, and a battery is only one of them. I swear this is my last pun of the day, but we need a battery of solutions, and only one of them is a battery. Four ways to make your energy system more flexible. The first is to make your grid bigger. The bigger your grid, the easier it is to match up supply and demand in different parts uh, of a region. So this figure is what China wants to do. They want to build a global grid. That's not going to work. But what could work is regional grids. A North American grid, a European and North African grid, an East Asian grid. This could work. There's some geopolitical issues to get over, but um, if you do this, you dramatically increase the amount of renewable energy that you can put on your grid. So the first and probably most important way, more important than energy storage even, is grid extension. The second way is to make your grid a whole lot smarter. This is complicated, but I want to zoom into one part, microgrids at the micro level. These are systems that allow consumers to turn on and off their electricity consumption to line up with electricity demand. The smarter your grid is, the more your customers are going to be able to respond to granular price signals and communicate with the grid in a two-way format. Lots of jargon here, but the, the bottom line is, if we can make sure that customers aren't just super unreliable, but we can depend on them to turn their space heaters and water heaters and electric vehicles on when there's excess solar on the grid and turn them off when there isn't solar energy, to even charge or to even plug in their electric vehicles and supply energy to the grid, 
well, then we can accommodate a whole lot more intermittent volatile solar energy. The third way is, yes, you guessed it, energy storage. Now, energy storage, particularly lithium ion batteries, have fallen in cost substantially in recent years. Lithium ion is following the same kind of cost trend as solar, I mean, as, as silicon solar. That's great, but it's got its part to play in the overall portfolio. Lithium ion batteries can store energy for hours, four, maybe six, maybe even eight. They're not gonna store energy for days, weeks, or even months. That's what the startups that Bill Gates just founded, uh, funded are attempting to do, store energy over seasons. If we can do that economically, then energy storage could be a much better silver bullet. But right now, energy storage, especially in the form of lithium ion batteries, or even hydroelectric reservoirs, is only one part of the solution. Finally, oh, I, I did want to prove this point to you. Let me prove this point to you. We did a study, my colleagues at MIT and I did a study where we said, all right, let's throw the kitchen sink at this problem. We're going to throw super cheap solar, 25 cents per watt. That's four times cheaper than today's solar. And we're going to throw super cheap batteries, $150 per kilowatt hour for a fully installed system. That's three to four times as cheap as today's battery systems. So super cheap solar, super cheap batteries. What do we get? We get that a majority of the energy still doesn't come from solar in the most cost-effective way. If you set up your grid in the most cost-effective way, you still rely a whole lot on natural gas. That's surprising, right? I gave you cheap batteries and cheap solar. But our simulation, what it spits out is that a whole range of other sources are needed in the most economical configuration. And it's largely because batteries don't work very well at storing energy for long periods of time. And you will often have long periods of time where either the sun isn't shining or there's high variability over seasons for solar energy. And even if you add a substantial amount of wind energy, which often blows when the sun isn't shining, you still need other sources of energy that are not wind and solar, the intermittent renewables. So I'll close with the fourth way of ensuring that you have a flexible grid. And it's the most obvious way. We've been doing it since we created electricity grids. It's to have generators that surround solar that are very flexible, that can ramp up and down. They could be natural gas plants. They could be nuclear power plants. We should talk nuclear if you guys don't like nuclear. I like nuclear. And if you put a balanced portfolio of a range of different energy sources, that's the best way for solar to become your shining star. I know I promised no more puns, but that was the last one. Finally, a policy recommendation. This is my last slide, I promise, Cameron. Um, there might be a marketing slide at the end. Uh, the last slide is, how do we achieve the innovation we need? Well, I come from the United States. I make recommendations to the United States government. That's what my institution does, the Council on Foreign Relations. Historically, we've had a great track record. We will make a recommendation. The government will tend to listen. This government, <laughs> not so sure. <laughs> But I, I maintain hope that, uh, that, that, that you know, we, we will rediscover that channel, that conduit to the executive office. I want the United States to continue to be the leader in energy innovation funding. China is about to eat our lunch. China is going to double its funding by 2021. That's going to be terrible in terms of U.S. prosperity and also in terms of U.S. leadership in enabling these innovations to get to market. And if we don't, really hope Europe picks up the slack. Um, and Britain, if you count. Sorry, that was too soon. <laughs> so with that, let me, uh, sorry, I know there's a marketing slide. Let me give it to, to Cameron. Thank you everyone for listening for this long. Uh, it probably took a lot, appreciate it. Thanks, thank you very much for, for remarkably clear and beautifully delivered talk. Now, um, some of you in the audience will know that the Oxford Martin School has had a program of research, in fact, addressing quite a few of these questions. It's the program on integrating renewable energy, and Nick Eyre, the co-director, is here. Also, the head of Oxford Energy in this talk is part of that series. So we, I, I, I dare not say we're ahead of you, because, of course, you know, you're... you're uh, Am I supposed to sit down? Um, no, no, we want him to answer questions. No, he's standing up there. Thank you very much, though. Uh, I'm chairing this. And... Uh, okay, 
so he's invited questions from you on topics such as artificial leaves and concentrated solar panels. Uh, and I've got questions as well of my own, but uh, I dare say I'm not going to get to ask them because I'm waiting to see the hands in the room. There is a roving microphone, uh, and if Lillian is still there, you can ask whether your... If, if your question has not been answered, you should have the, the opportunity to ask it again. It's been answered? Very good. Okay. Uh, but do we have questions from Nick to start us off here, yeah, I think? So I, I, I want to pick up on your point about um, uh, lithium-ion batteries not being the, the, the silver bullet for, for uh, flexibility. Um, what about uh, adding hydrogen or some other liquid or gaseous fuel made from electrolysis at, at times of high renewable output? Um, is the combination somewhat closer to a silver bullet? Uh, I'm a huge fan. and, and um you, I appreciate you asking the question because I skipped that slide. I'm a huge fan. Do you want to go back? Uh, sure. T take the control. Uh, Tom's turning the screen. Sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Tom, if you're listening, uh, you can turn it back yeah, on. And, okay, great. Yep. Oh, sweet. So um, let's try and find that slide. I do think that uh, this is a very important um, potential solution. What I'm showing you here is a future solar refinery, not an oil refinery. A solar refinery could involve uh, either an artificial leaf or what you probably suggested, PV-powered electrolysis, to produce hydrogen fuel by splitting water. OK, that's great. So, so we use you know, abundant sunlight and really cheap solar energy to split water. I'm personally, by the way, uh, very excited about artificial leaf technology, which does this in a single step, but you could also power an electrolyzer if you can get the electrolyzer cheap enough, which we don't know if we can do. Uh, you, you know if you can do it? Wow, they're falling in cost, don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let's say we produce hydrogen. That hydrogen then gets used to power cars. There's at least one car on the market, the Toyota Mirai, that can do this. So fuel cell uh, vehicles can use that. But that hydrogen can also be used in a diverse set of other ways in addition to being a transport fuel. For example, you can imagine taking the carbon dioxide from a smokestack, it could be a steel plant, it could be a power plant, and combining it with hydrogen to produce a range of petroleum substitutes. And then you can power a range of industries, fertilizer, plastics, pharmaceuticals. So basically hydrogen can be this you know, universal jack of all trades kind of fuel or energy carrier that enables you to replace oil across the global economy. I think that's super important. And I think that that is lost when people talk, again, in a silver bullet way about electrifying everything. It is cognitively satisfying to say the solution to our energy needs is to electrify, 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 right? Let's uh, make sure that instead of you know, burning fossil fuels, we will uh, use electric industrial processes, electric vehicles, and we'll just make sure that all of our electricity comes from renewable sources. Well, there are some sources or some uses that are just not electrifiable, at least not on a reasonable time frame. Electric planes may take a long time to come around, long distance shipping, long haul trucking, and a range of industries. And I think hydrogen, like Nick mentioned, is a compelling substitute uh, if we want to achieve a clean energy revolution. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about solar, because solar can not just provide electricity, it could also provide us portable fuels, and portable fuels are way more convenient than solar electricity. Great. So there's a question right here. So, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I raised my hand when you asked about subsidies. Yeah. So I wonder where do you put the, put the line about the engagement of the state? Um, because when you show the example on Nigeria, there's clearly the state making a decision, making choices about what they want to do and what others should do. Uh, and probably it was about two different business interests, the business interest of uh, the uh, enter enterprises of the uh, microgrids and the business interest of private companies that have the large grid. Yeah. So um, how do you uh, sort of draw the line about state intervention and not intervention? Man, I was hoping no one would ask that question. I think it's a terrific question. Um, let me start by talking broadly about my philosophy on 
what governments should and shouldn't do when it comes to solar. Um, I think that to date, government policy has been extraordinarily effective in bringing solar to where it is. So it's thanks to subsidies and mandates that we are where we are today. Um, there is a chapter in a manuscript I'm reviewing now on the history of solar called Germany's Gift to the World. Thanks to Germany, hey, thanks Germany. Um, they subsidized the deployment of solar power and en enabled a global industry to scale up thanks to the largesse of the Germans. They're still paying for it right now. Um, because of these subsidies that enabled the scale up, we have cheap solar. Going forward, however, I do not believe this policy regime can continue. To date, fully 15% of all of the funding from solar has come from governments. In the future, if we want solar to be not 2% of the global electricity mix, but 33%, governments can't afford those kinds of sums. That means that they have to find other ways to incentivize solar to continue growing while contributing an ever dwindling share of the investment in solar and relying more on the private sector. That means recognizing that today's silicon solar panel is a very mature technology. It doesn't need to be subsidized anymore. In my country, the United States, we have a subsidy called the investment tax credit. It probably should go away very soon. It's scheduled to sunset. I hope it actually does. But that doesn't mean governments have no role. I think that there are many policies that could be helpful in enabling the next generation of technologies to replace the current generation. Now, some in the United States, especially in the Republican Party, will accuse those policymakers of picking winners and losers, which is a valid fear. But I actually think that if you do this carefully enough, the benefits outweigh the costs or the risks that if you uh, support a diverse portfolio of next generation breakthrough technologies, you might have a lot of failed bets, but you also could have some successful ones and you'll embolden the private sector, like Bill Gates, to invest in these new technologies. I also think the government has a role to play in encouraging systemic innovation, building long distance transmission lines, for example, that the private sector may not on its own build. Uh, or, you know, creating markets, energy markets, uh, that do a great job of having a diverse mix of generators prosper, rather than, you know, causing conflict between generators that otherwise should be complementary with one another. So there's a lot of things that policymakers can do. The thing I don't want them to do is shell out subsidies, because I don't think they can afford it. Finally, in this particular case, because I know you think I've been deflecting, uh, which I have been, because your question was really good, um, you're right. In, in this particular case, Nigeria, or any developing country government, is uh, trying to play between two different interests and trying to find the right path. What they're going to have to do is be technocratically honest. What does the simulation tell you? The simulation tells you that the lowest cost way of achieving energy access in this region is not to electrify it. That is politically unpopular. That village is going to be like, are you kidding me? You're not going to bring the central grid out because some simulation told you that there are too many hills in the way? But you have to be honest to what the data tells you is the most cost-effective way to electrify the whole nation. That takes courageous pop, uh, policymakers. Thanks for the question. Great, thank you. Right, more questions. We've got a... Uh, no, sorry. We've got a question up the back from the woman in the far corner, and then uh, Chris Welland-Smith next. There. Uh, you, you talk about private investment. And I think investors need really good, accurate, timely information. And I'm wondering, what are your favorite companies right now that are into smart grid technologies, uh, maybe advising countries on how to set up efficient systems like we've seen in Nigeria, or battery innovation? Who are the leading players in the industry? Uh, just as an investor, I'd love to know what those companies are. <laughs> So, top, top investment tips. Please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> None of what, I'm sure I have to give some disclosure. None of what I say could be construed as investment advisor. For <laughs> forward material information. Um, you know, I'd look to, to some of the startups to see what are the interesting companies looking to the frontier, especially of harnessing digital technologies uh, to make our grids smarter. <laughs> Let me pause and give you a plug. Uh, on June 20th, my next book launches. It's called Digital Decarbonization, and it's all about digital technologies to reduce emissions. The reason I uh, you know, thought of this idea was it's way easier to do digital technologies than these new materials like solar materials and perovskites. So digital technologies could have an impact right now. Let me give you an example of what one of these cool companies could do. A company called Bijli. Um, this is, uh, Bijli is the Hindi word for electricity or light. I can't remember. This company in Silicon Valley uh, uses the data from smart meters 
in order to figure out which of your appliances is consuming electricity and causing your bill to be high at the end of the month. By using that information, a power utility can give you better data on how to reduce your own bill and your own energy consumption, and in doing so, reduce your carbon footprint. In addition, that sort of information can then make it possible for you to very intelligently engage with the utility to be helpful to the grid rather than a burden on the grid. Because if you can say, now the grid has sent me a signal, I need to reduce my energy consumption very granularly, here's how I can do that. Well, then you and the grid can cooperate to make it easier for solar energy uh, to coexist uh, with these new smart appliances. So that's an example of harnessing data science and artificial intelligence uh, to reduce energy consumption. By the way, one of the coolest things they're doing is using a machine learning model to figure out in a home that has no smart meter, but some neighboring regions do, that home that measures its electricity once a month, they can actually figure out how much each appliance uses using AI and machine learning. It blew my mind that this is possible, uh, but it tells you about the rapid advances in data science. Um, you mentioned energy storage as well. Um, you know, I'd point you, again, uh, to companies that are using batteries, but pairing them with intelligent systems to operate the batteries as effectively as possible. Because a battery can do many things for you. It can do what's called arbitrage. It can you know, charge up when energy is cheap and discharge when energy is expensive and make you some money. Uh, your battery can reduce the max amount of energy that you demand at any instant. That can reduce your bill if you're a business. Companies like STEM, or advanced microgrid systems in California are developing ways, intelligent systems, to use batteries in your homes and businesses, reduce your bills, and help the grid out uh, if, if, if the utility uh, decides to comply and, and, and work with those companies. So those are the sorts of things I would look at if I were you. Again, no material forward-looking information from me. Thanks. Great, thank you for the investment tips. Um, <laughs> I, I, I could add to them that there's, there's so many new startups in this space uh, that probably most of them will fail. Uh, but, but some of them will change the world. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So I think, um, Chris, you were next. Well, the mic, oh, you've got the mic, great. So I, I share your enthusiasm for hydrogen, but uh, you shouldn't neglect pneumonia, which could be a better <coughs> option for some purposes. It's much cheaper to store than hydrogen. It's nasty, smelly stuff. You probably won't use it in transport, though it was used in Belgium in buses during the war, actually. But for static storage and later putting power back on the grid, it looks very attractive. There's some very interesting work going on on this in Oxford. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. That was a good, quick one. Thank you. So further questions? Yes, there. The gentleman in blue. So I guess um, you didn't show any plots on semi-log scale, but, you know, if you plot... Um, solar production going up, it actually hits 20% of world power in nine years, right, in 2017. And you also didn't make it clear it's been going down at 10% per year. You sort of suggested that we've got to get to 40% per year to make things happen, but you were a bit vague on that part. So I wondered if you could say why you think we really, 10% isn't good enough, and, 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 where do you think we're actually going to fall off of the 45% uh, per year increase that's been happening in solar energy production? So and, let me just get this straight. Exactly why. <laughs> you wanted... I think, let me just say, yeah, yeah. I think your estimates are too pessimistic. Got it. But, but, but let me get this straight. You wanted more charts? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I, I, I always appreciate um, a, a chart lover, and I, I really thought I entertained you with enough charts, but I will, I will add the semi-log plot you wanted. Um, to, to answer your question in, in broad terms, the question is basically, why am I so sure that at the rate of cost declines that we observe for solar energy and the increase in solar production, why am I so sure that it's going to hit a wall? And why am I so sure that we can't just rely on today's technology and, you know, the adequacy of today's systems, which appear to be working just fine. And my answer to you, sir, is I don't know that we'll hit that wall or that ceiling, but I think there's a substantial risk. And because I think there is such a risk, I think it's a worthwhile risk management approach to start investing in alternatives right now. A, 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 a you know, an analog which isn't perfect is, you know, if, you, if you're worried that the climate's going to warm, but you aren't quite sure exactly how much it's going to warm by, it's probably a pretty good risk management strategy to start acting now. 
So, so, so now let me get specific. Um, last year, solar energy grew by about 26% um, uh, in terms of uh, production of solar panels. I think your 45% number, I, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it relates to the actual production of gigawatt hours from solar facilities. Um, solar electricity, uh, so, so, sorry, the, the cost of solar panels has declined at a relatively regular rate of somewhere between 20 and 30% for every cumulative doubling of production. I expect such a cost decline to continue, but my modeling shows that if that decline continues and the value deflation that we've observed in the frontier markets such as California also continues as the world deploys a whole lot of solar, the value of solar will undercut its cost well before we get to 20% solar penetration. So basically what I'm saying is we cannot extrapolate existing trends because solar will eat its own lunch before we get there. Now, I don't know that that's true. It may be true that batteries get super, super good and solar gets super, super cheap all by itself and we don't need to invest in any new technologies, but I don't want to bet the house on it. By the house, I mean the planet. I want to be clear. I mean, I think I think the improvements will depend on all those other investments. Yeah. And I think we will keep making because yeah. technology curves. One technology rolls off, and the next one rolls on. And I think I think that's important. But I still think your estimates are too conservative. Great. Well, you can have that debate uh, later, I'm sure. Now, I think we've probably at most got time for one or possibly two very quick questions. So we've got one right up the back and one right up the front, just to keep Clara. Moving. Uh, my question is about investment and new materials. So new materials, something is, I'm a physicist, so I a little bit know about what these are. And your, your graphs, they illustrated very clearly that you have perovskites just within 10 years, you have a big, big efficiency gain. And uh, new, newer materials could be coming. So they're quantum dots, and you could think about something like plasmonic coupling of quantum dots, and where you were harnessing just a part of the spectrum, now you get the entire spectrum to enjoy um, for, because of wide resonances. So, but this, this may need time. And also you said about big pocketed investors who would try investing, giving money for, for these things to grow. So imagine like an investor who has a lot of money and now your grids, which is nice that the grids are localized, but it's still much more than making a little industry, like a little factory. It is still going to be some area, it's a lot of investment, even to make a small grid. So if an investor wants to put in, maybe this could be one reason that why investors aren't so interested. The technology is new, so he may think that, okay, I wanna give out billion euros, but as your trends, they show, okay, there is, an, to, to, to invest in, putting solar panels, which are, say, silicon or something based on, on peroxides. And tomorrow, there is a possibility that something else comes with a double the efficiency. So for an investor, don't you think it's a problem to decide whether should, I should invest such a huge amount of money into something which is still in its, in its early stages? Great. Hey, so, and with my eye on the clock, thank you very much. If you could try and answer that while the microphone is getting up the front. So you got, got it. 10 hey, seconds. That's a great point. I think some of the technologies you mentioned super promising, uh, like plasmonic resonance. And I'll quickly say that you're right. This is a, a, an issue. If you're an investor, you don't want your investment to be obsolete the moment you make it. But right now, if you're an investor in many markets in the world, it's going to make sense to build a solar plant, a solar farm, for example, that will have a contract with what's known as an off-taker, someone who buys the electricity for 20 or 25 years. You can get that deal right now. And if you get that deal, it's going to make you money for a while. The barrier is not that the investment opportunity isn't there. It's that these guys don't want to diligence the deal, and that's why they need vehicles to buy and trade these projects. Thanks for the question. Thank you. And one sentence question and a one sentence answer, and then we're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any limits on the commodity side to batteries, for example? Do you think that the fact that half the world's <coughs> cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo is a good thing. I have learned my lesson not to bet uh, against, or to bet on commodity scarcity uh, back with the rare earth scare, when you know, we worried that China would choke off the world's supply of rare earth minerals. 
uh, and then they were found elsewhere. So even though currently most of the world's cobalt comes from Congo, uh, it's not clear to me that it always will. Um, you know, commodity uh, scarcity tends to drive uh, new production elsewhere. So I'm personally not worried about that particular bottleneck. Great. You, we, you can continue that one outside too. Now, before I thank Varun, I just wanted to alert you to two key things. So the first is, as ever, at the Oxford Martin School, we have a range of interesting talks and issues coming up on the agenda within the next week or two. Uh, sessions on Ethiopian development, child poverty, population, population aging, and archaeology. That's point one. Uh, and many other things. I mean, there's more in the Oxford uh, Energy Colloquium series of lectures too, which you can find on the Oxford Energy website and the other talks on the Oxford Martin School website. The second key point is that you are all welcome and indeed encouraged to join us for a drink in the Illy Cafe, turn right as you go out the main door, uh, where there will be deeply discounted books for sale. So please join me in thanking Varun for a very stimulating and enjoyable talk. Thank you very much.